Most families love to have an open play area, and the lawn is the perfect solution. It also looks very nice. You can have a beautiful lawn without spending a lot of time and without using any chemicals. I'm Elliot Coleman. And I'm Barbara Damrush. And if you'll stay with us for the next half hour, we'll give you some lawn care tips on gardening naturally. gotten a kind of a bad rap lately. They're not particularly interesting. A lot of people seem enslaved to their lawns. It seems like they have to spend at least half of every weekend mowing it and taking care of it. But lawns have their positive side, too. I always like to think of them as a large green garden. They make a wonderful frame for other parts of the landscape, and they're one of the few ground covers that you can run on, play on, and generally abuse. Well, that's all very true. I think the problem comes when you have all lawn. Then you have a situation called a monoculture. And if ecology tells us anything, they tell us that diversity is the most important thing to have in your environment. So you have to start thinking about other things you can have besides lawns. And there are many other fine, fascinating ground covers that you can use instead, or in addition to a lawn. Here, I'll show you. There's a large area here between the lawn and the fence with some trees at one end of it that I decided not to have in lawn at all. For one thing, I don't think lawn is appropriate under trees. It doesn't grow well under trees, and in nature you wouldn't find grassy areas under trees. You'd find carpets of small herbaceous perennials, ground covers, we would call them. This is Tiarella cordifolia, or foam flower. It's a wonderful American native from the Appalachians, but it's hardy in my cold climate too. It has lovely white foamy flowers, and it's gonna start to spread out here beautifully. This is Actea rubra, or baneberry, which is going to do something similar, a little bit taller. This is Telema grandiflora, and it will carpet the area, too. Now, some of my ground covers are real eager beavers, and they're already doing their job. These forget-me-nots have made a nice mass here. And the violets next to them, they're already flowing in together. And that's exactly the effect I wanted here. Now, you may be familiar with some ground covers already, like Pachysandra or Periwinkle. Those are fine, but it might be fun to experiment with some new ones. Here's a ground cover I'm particularly fond of. It's wintergreen, an American native. The Latin name is Galtheria procumbens. It makes nice red berries that are good for the birds. Nice thing about it is that it's evergreen, and it will grow in both sun and shade, in my experience, if your summers aren't too hot. It'll grow into a nice mat here, too. Now, this is one you may know already. This is a juga, or bugle. This is one called Burgundy Glow, and it's making a nice maroon mass there. And it's growing into my carpet of woolly thyme. I just love woolly thyme. Isn't that nice? And that'll even take a little bit of foot traffic. The reason I've planted these two right here on the edge is that they're gonna form almost a mowing strip here. I can actually run my mower along here these are so flat that they're not going to be cut by the lawnmower, and I can get right up to the edge here and take care of the grass here, so I probably won't even need to use an edging tool here. So, here's my little ground cover bed. I think the key to remember here is, yes, have a lawn, but decide just how much lawn you really need, and think of some creative solutions to those other areas where you don't want a lawn. We planted a little urban flower garden here, and now we're installing a lawn strip next to it. It's kind of a problem spot, though, because we've got this fine old maple tree here that we really love, and it has just not appreciated having all this construction going on around it. It tends to stress the surface roots, the feeder roots. So, we're not gonna put a lawn right up next to the tree. As you can see, it wouldn't be a very hospitable place for grass anyway. It's kind of bumpy, and you can see this big roots near the surface. So we've staked out a little circle around it, and we're going to put in one of those ground covers we talked about. Now, we had to bring in some topsoil here because there was kind of a dip. But again, we've been very, very careful of the tree. You don't want to add more than maximum three inches of soil on top of the roots because you might deprive them of oxygen. So we just raked out some rocks. It was pretty bony soil. We didn't get compulsive about it. We took out anything maybe bigger than an egg. 
We found that the best way to scoop those up was with this handy silage fork that we picked up at a local hardware store. It has scooped tines that are close together. You can get those big rocks up, but the little stuff just falls right through. Handy item to have around. The soil we got for here was actually pretty fertile, so we didn't have to add any nitrogen. But we did sprinkle some compost on top. I always like to add extra organic matter for anything I'm growing. Now, normally, we might have tilled that in, but again, we're protecting the roots of the tree, so we just raked it into the surface of the soil. Now, that probably limited us a little bit because we might have wanted to deal with a compacted area. What we did for compacted areas was to do what you might want to call spiking. You just take a garden fork, push it into the soil, and come back a little bit like that. Just to loosen things up, you won't disturb the surface roots of an old tree like this too much, but it will allow air and water to pass and grow a healthier lawn. But the other key that we wanted to add was mineral nutrients to put a long-term fertility in here because this grass is going to be here for a long time. The two we used were phosphate rock and green sand. Phosphate rock is a long-term source of phosphorus, and green sand contains trace elements and potassium, trace elements being particularly important for the health and long-term vitality of anything you're growing. And we sprinkled those on the surface at the rate of about 10 pounds per 100 square feet, and again, just put them in with the rake. But the key nutrient on our soil is limestone. This is an acid soil, and if we don't put limestone on and make the pH higher, make the soil sweeter, grass isn't going to grow at all no matter what we do. If you're not sure the area you're in, whether you need limestone or not, get a soil test made by your local extension service. Now I'm just sprinkling this lime on with a scoop, same rate as he put the other stuff on, 10 pounds per 100 square feet. But if you're not good at math, just put it on until you, the surface of the soil is good and white. That's good enough. Okay, and then we're going to rake this in and we'll be ready to plant grass seed. Okay, looks like we got it all nicely raked. We're ready to go. Let's plant some grass. Yeah. Now, we put in our little flower garden in the spring, and we resisted the impulse to put the lawn in at the same time. We forced ourselves to look at all of this bare soil all summer long. But now it's getting close to early fall, and we're going to finally plant the grass. In our climate, fall is definitely the best time to seed lawns. We can count on the fall rains to keep it nice and moist and give the grass all the water it wants. And, but secondly, if there are any annual weed seeds in here that are going to sprout along with the grass, there's hardly any season left for them. They'll soon wilt and die, and the grass will get all the light it needs for healthy growth. But of course, it depends on where you do live. Since we live in a cool climate, we choose a cool season grass. And these are best planted in the late summer or early fall. You're putting it into a nice warm seed bed, and then it goes into some nice, cool, rainy weather to get it off to a good start. It's acclimated to where we're going to put it. If we lived in a warm climate, say zone eight and warmer than that, we'd choose a warm season grass. Those like warm weather. So we'd plant that in spring, get it off to a good start as you're going into the warm weather. Now, if you're not sure what kind of grass to plant for the place where you live, best thing to do is talk to your local extension service, your hardware store, your garden center, and find out about the many grass varieties that are available and which one is best suited to your climate. To get the grass seed into the ground, you want to spread it some way. On a really large area, I'd use a chest seeder like this. It has a strap that goes over my head. I fill the hopper with seed, set the opening, turn the handle, and it spreads the grass out very nicely. On a medium-sized area, I might rent one of those hand push spreaders from the hardware store that drop the seed in even rows. Or, as we're gonna do, on this small area, by hand. Monsieur. Thank you, ma'am. I'm gonna scatter it with an even hand motion, very much way the farmers that used to seed grain many hundreds of years ago. As I spread across, I open my fingers, and it comes out with a very even motion. Remember, I don't want to get it in the flower bed on that side or on that side, and this will as I do it. I might miss a little area, but the grass will fill in there eventually next year when it grows. Now, as soon as Elliot starts putting seed down, I start following behind him and pressing it into the soil. What I'm doing is just dragging the back of the tines of my silage fork gently through the grass seed so that it just presses it in. 
if I raked it in, it would rearrange the grass seed, and it, it wouldn't distribute it as evenly. Another tool you could use is just the back of an ordinary rake. Doesn't work quite as easily, but it works. Now, I'm not worrying about the fact that I'm stepping on where I just sowed. You will find that where you've been walking, the grass comes up just as well, if not better, just because you've compacted it with your feet. It would take forever to put footprints all over this whole area. So when we're establishing a lawn, we prefer to come next with a garden roller. What this does is to press the seed and moist soil together so the seeds can absorb the moisture they need to germinate. Now for this, I prefer a roller with an open mesh. And what this does is give me a surface that isn't completely compacted and doesn't inhibit the sprouts of the seeds from coming through. If your roller has a smooth surface, that's fine. It'll work almost as well. Golly, that should make a wonderful lawn. Yeah, I think so. All we need now is a good rain. Yeah, I'm not even going to bother to water this because this time of year we're probably going to get Absolutely. a good rain soon. That could be too much of a good thing if this were on a sloping site, though. So I'm going to show you what to do if you were planting on a slope. I'm just going to scatter this straw very thinly. I could also use salt hay. Neither of those would have any weed seeds that would germinate in the grass. Very thinly so that the sunlight and the water can both get in. Just enough to keep the grass seed from washing away. Well, the rest is up to Mother Nature. And Father Time. <laughs> people, when they see these beautiful yellow flowers in the lawn, go, ah, dandelions, and they rush to get rid of them. I go, aha, dandelions, and I start thinking of dinner. I take an asparagus knife with a nice pointed tip here, push it into the ground around a young one. Hasn't gone to flower yet. It's going to be a lot tastier. That's some of the best eating you could have. Now, we don't have very fertile soil here, so our wild dandelions don't get big. In some areas with fertile soil, they'll get two and three times bigger than ours. So what do we do for big dandelions? We plant them in the fertile garden. The Europeans have been way ahead of us. They sell seeds for French dandelions, Italian dandelions, and you can have them anytime you want them. So whether you plant seeds or harvest them wild, you really ought to consider dandelions for dinner. If you've chosen the right lawn grasses and prepared your soil well, you're not going to have to do much maintenance on your lawn. We're going to show you a rather extreme example of a lawn that can take care of itself. Now, this is just a nice green patch in front of the tool shed that's next to our vegetable garden. 20 years ago, when we tilled up the garden, we tilled up this lawn area, too. We never planted anything here, but slowly grasses and broadleaf plants came in. And if they were too tall, we'd cut them off with a sigh or sickle. And over time, that favored the low-growing ones, and pretty soon we had a lawn. So these are just grasses that have decided to grow here. We've never even fertilized it, Elliot. And look at the nice, healthy green color it has. Looks fantastic. You know, it's interesting. Turf specialists in recent years have been figuring out that most of the lawn problems that people have is from over-fertilizing. They've been killing their lawns with kindness. They put a lot of nitrogen on. This discourages the soil microorganisms that are keeping the lawn healthy. So as a result, a lot of diseases come in. They're susceptible to pests. They feed them more. They have to keep feeding and feeding, and they become fertilizer junkies. All we put on this lawn is just some limestone. And the reason we do that is by raising the soil pH, making the soil sweeter, we create conditions in the soil that favor the microorganisms. And the microorganisms, healthy microorganisms in the soil, lead to healthy grasses. Now, a lot of people worry about the broadleaf weeds that creep into lawns. Basically, lawn grasses are stronger than the broadleaf weeds. And uh, they'll tend to crowd them out anyway, especially if you're mowing. That will discourage the weeds. If this were a more public area, Barbara and I would be concerned about the weeds in here. And if that were true, I'd take an asparagus knife or fishtail weeder like this and poke its sharp edge right into the soil underneath the crown of the plant, and I'd be able to pull them out neatly without disturbing the soil, and the grass would come in and fill around it. If you do a little bit of this at a time, you'd be surprised how large an area you can take care of. And if you can't do it all, Maybe you can pay the kids 25 cents a bag for going out and doing it for you. You know, it's interesting, Elliot. This here used to be once considered a noxious lawn weed. Now we know that clover is really good for your lawn. 
Clover is not only good for your lawn, it's lucky for the lawn, same way a four-leaf clover is lucky for you. Clover is a legume, and it has the ability to extract nitrogen from the air and store it on its roots under the ground. The clover plant doesn't need all that nitrogen. Some of the extra is left over for the grasses, and it benefits them greatly. So really, the only big maintenance job we have for our lawn is mowing. And of course, mowing does a lot more for your lawn than just make it look nice. Mowing makes you part of the ecological selection process. When you come over here at that short height every so often, you're selecting only for low-growing plants. And of course, those are the ones that look best in your lawn. Of course, how high you mow your lawn is something you've got to pay attention to. You don't want to clip it really close, like a golf course. It won't keep it healthy. On the other hand, you don't want to let it go too long and get too high. It'll be too hard to mow. Another reason for leaving your lawn at a decent height is that leaves enough of the grass blade to photosynthesize and send food back down to be stored in the grass roots and keep it healthy. And another way you keep it healthy is when you do mow, leave those little clippings on the lawn. They'll also work their way down into the soil and compost and become a natural fertilizer for your lawn, which will again aid in keeping it very healthy. If you have a rotary mower, don't put the bagger on there. Don't take the clippings away, leave them here. They're gonna do a lot of good in the long run. And speaking of power mowers, we don't own one. You're gonna think us a little funny and old fashioned, but we have our his and hers hand push mowers. I think these are fun to use. I don't like the big whir of the engine and the smell of the gasoline fumes. I like to listen to the clickety clack. It's perhaps a little harder work, but it's good exercise. Just as much fun as jogging, I think. More fun than jogging, I'd say. Mowing your lawn with a push mower is really enjoyable. But as with any other cutting tool, it's important that the tool be sharp. This one is rusted. That's a good sign that maybe it needs sharpening. And sharpening is a very easy job. You can ask at your lawnmower dealer about the availability of a kit like this, which has the tools in it that will allow you to quickly and easily sharpen your lawnmower. First, bend it back like that to raise the cutting reel off the ground. Then, take a screwdriver and pry off the hub cap on the side and take off this little E-ring that holds the wheel in place. I always carefully put the E-ring into the hub cap so I won't lose it. Then you want to remove the wheel and the next thing you'll see is a little driving gear in here. Remove that also, but being very careful that the little piece of metal in here, the pawl that makes the gear make contact, doesn't fall out. Then when you open your sharpening kit, you'll find it has a handle, which you can put over here, make contact with that pawl, and you're ready to turn. Now the next thing you need is the sharpening compound. And this is almost like the same thing you would use if you were doing a valve job. It's a gritty compound, and you paint it very carefully on the edges of the reel. You notice there's no file involved in this sharpening. It's abrasive, and the key to a mower is that you have two cutting blades, the reel blade and the stationary blade down here, and you want them to be identically matched. And you do that because this grinding compound then grinds between the two as you turn this handle and move the real blade against the stationary blade. Now, always turn the handle counterclockwise because you want the real blade to go backwards to the direction it normally goes when you're cutting grass. You need to do this for about seven to 10 minutes. Well, now I think we have a nice shiny blade here. We certainly do, and that's the best indication that it's good and sharp. The next step is to take a rag like this and clean all that compound off both the real blades and the stationary blade. Now, there's one last adjustment. The stationary blade is held in place by a pair of screws on the back side here, and one of these screws twists and pushes the stationary blade away from the real blade. The other one, if you twist it, will move the stationary blade closer to the real blade. If the reel is turning easily, not making much sound, and is contacting the blade, you're in pretty good shape. If you can put a piece of paper in there and move that two blades across each other, 
then you have it almost as good as you can get it. And when that's an adjustment and the blades are sharp, mowing with a real mower is a real pleasure. The best way to maintain your natural lawn without doing too much work is to focus on the soil and not on the grass. You can turn brown spots green with a little can of green paint or some extra nitrogen fertilizer, but that's only a temporary solution. What you want to do is focus on the soil, getting a healthy soil filled with organic matter, and soon those brown spots won't be brown anymore because they have the growing conditions that grass needs to be green and vigorous. And I do that by coming out here in the fall with a wheelbarrow of sifted topsoil and compost and spreading a thin layer on the soil, top dressing, wherever there are weak spots. Just a little, little spread like that, about 3 eighths of an inch thick. It works its way down in between the grass blades and gives the soil the vigor it needs to grow healthy green grass. I also think it's important to keep your lawn in perspective. Now, out in nature, there are grasslands, there are woodlands, there are wetlands. So think of your lawn as just the grassland part of your property in a much more varied landscape. Well, those are our thoughts on lawn care. And so for now, goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, doing something for your home can be easy, even fun. Check and see here on Home Bodies. Then, add value to your home with some serious improvements. The Home Pro shows you how.